All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out this morning. I'm Mike Bluestein, developer evangelist with Xamarin. I'm, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about Coco Sharp. Now, I, I do a lot of development, and I've been done various types of development for years. Most of the work I've done has been application development or frameworks, some scientific applications over the years, different things on different platforms, servers, and now mobile in the recent years. I actually work from home, and I have for, for quite some time. So, and I also have young children. Now, my son, who, who's seven, you know, parents want to get their kids in, involved in things. You don't want to push them too much. But I want them to share my love of computers if they're interested. And, and they do. They like, but what they like to do, especially my son, he likes to play games. Um, so I'm at home working. They see what I'm doing a lot of the time. And I get pretty excited about what we do at Xamarin. I'm, I'll, I'll get pretty jazzed if I get some really great scroll performance on a UI table view or implement some really cool UI collection view layout. Wow, this is great. So you show that to a seven-year-old, and you say, hey, look at this great UI collection view layout I have, and this amazing performance where I'm rendering, the, you know, animating the scroll view of my, uh, or, or a UI table view in my iOS app. Seven-year-olds, oh, that's bored to death. That's totally, un un totally unexciting to him. Now, if you can show a game, though, even a little simple game, suddenly, oh, that opens up a, a world of excitement to them. And it makes them, you know, they want to play games, but now they start in interacting with you. They want to you know, ex explore their own creativity. So that's kind of why I'm interested on a personal basis even, and even, what I'm about to show you here today, our, our, a new game framework that we have, um, open source, called Coco Sharp. And Coco, Coco Sharp is fantastic. I'm even um, building a little game with my son. Um, he's doing all the art. He's you know, drawing it with his crayons and his markers, and we're scanning it in, even doing the audio work recording, and, and he's doing the creative side, and we're putting it together, and I'm you know, just programming it with Coco Sharp. And he's sort of the project manager telling me what to do, and you know, is that good or is bad? Usually he says, oh, bad. <laughs> you know, and then I, I go and I do it, and we make some changes, and I'm clearly dragging the project down because he's way ahead of me with the art, so I need to, I need to, you know, I need to shape up there. So that's my sort of personal story of why I'm interested in it. Independent of that, though, I've always been really interested in graphics and graphical applications, whether they be games or whatnot. And certainly doing things cross-platform is what we're, you know, a big part of what we're all about at Xamarin. So I'm pleased to be able to, you know, I'm real excited to be able to show you, um, you know, introduce you to Coco Sharp here today. So here's a quote, from, uh, a piece of a quote that Miguel made on the blog post when he announced the thing. Like Coco Sharp blends the power of the Coco's 2D programming model with C Sharp and the .NET framework. And the API, this last part is key, the API has been designed to follow C Sharp and .NET idiom. So it's very idiomatic C Sharp. You know, it's unlike other, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's based on the Coco's 2D um, programming model, and there's a variety of implementations of Coco Sharp across different languages. The thing here is it's not just a straight line-by-line -line port. It's designed for the .NET developer, and this is a very poignant statement. You know, Miguel's a very smart guy, clearly. So I have another take on it, though, that's that a little different from myself. Is This is why, you know, why I like it. it it's cool, um, and, and very cool to, to kids and cool to anybody. You can create some really fun things, even whether they be complex or not. Not. Um, it's just a fun thing to work with, right? So let's talk a little bit about Coco Sharp. Coco Sharp is a 2D game framework, right? Sprite-based scene graph type of thing, and it's cross-platform. It's open source. I'm going to present you mobile um, things today, and I'll show I'll show an example after on the iPhone. It would work on Windows Phone, works on Android, works on desktop platforms as well. It builds on top of Mono Game, so it can target actually all the all the platforms that you'd be able to target with Mono Game, even though we're focusing on mobile here today. And I have a little example I'm going to show you. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so let's go into what makes up a game. And you can see here, there's one of, a, one of the samples that we have that actually would run in different places. There you have it running on a Mac. In a Coco Sharp game, you have an application. You have scenes that, where you're managing basically the levels, you know, the screens you would be displaying and your game logic. Layers, which are layered within a scene, the top level place where you put all your graphics and your sprites which represent the images that are moving around on the screen. Actions, and this is where it gets very interesting, very declarative way to program against a game. So you can describe that I want to move, I want to jump, do things like that, and it just happens for you. And you can chain these things together. Um, so it's a very high-level game framework, makes it very pleasant and easy to create games with. And then there's a lot of other cool stuff that you, you would expect in a game framework, like particle systems, effects that you can do that are very easy to program right out of the box, great audio support that's, that's a snap to put in, and even um, support for bringing in different physics engines and I'll show you one here today, okay? So first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go through the API. I'm gonna take you on a little tour of all the th a variety of the things that are in Coco Sharp. 
So when you start off with Cocoa Sharp, the, the sort of entry to the kingdom here is a CC application. CC application takes care of creating and initializing the graphics device for you, so you don't have to get down into the, the minutia of handling that. Sets up this thing called an application delegate, which I'm going to explain in a second, that you would you know, manage some initialization code in and you know, application-wide callbacks, things like going into the background and setting up some things, stuff like that. And most importantly, it starts the game. Okay, you would work with this, and it's really the one place you'd be working with. And even though it's in the common API of Cocoa Sharp, you'd be doing it in a little bit of bootstrapping code in each platform-specific project. Very similar code, but a little different. And we're going to see. Then you go into the shared code. So, this is the code to create a CC application in iOS. Three lines of code. You just create a CC application. You set your app delegate, which I'm going to describe and show you what's involved in that, and you start the game. Pretty simple. So it's actually a, a, a cleaner and neater implementation than other Cocos 2D implementations I've seen across other platforms and languages in my in my travels. So one thing that one of the things you saw there is the CC application. It creates this thing called a CC application delegate. Now, if there's iOS developers in the room, this might look this will look very familiar. It's very much like what. Uh, an app delegate is in iOS proper, UI application delegate, except it's just for Cocoa Sharp and it's cross-platform, okay? But the programming model would be very similar. And if you haven't done iOS development, it's, it'll be very straightforward anyway. So you're handling application lifecycle type of things. Stuff like when you move, your application moves into the background, what do you have to do either state-wise, turning off audio, re returning to audio when you move back into the foreground, a little bit of initialization code that you would have, such as setting up where the content, your resources go in the application, and loading up the first scene that you see. These are the things, so if you see these, me you know, these methods here that you can implement in app, in CC application delegate to handle the life cycle, like as I just mentioned, such as foregrounding and backgrounding. Very familiar, if you, you, this is gonna look you know, almost identical if you're coming from iOS, but if you're not, obviously pretty straightforward as well, okay? Now, one of the other things you're doing in, in, in the application delegate is you're setting up the, the content folder. The content folder is where you're gonna put all your resources, and it's just a folder in your solution, right? So you, you'd set it up in Visual Studio, you can work with it, or of course in, in um, Xamarin Studio as well. Right? And this is where you're going to be putting any, you know, any font files that you have, like bitmap fonts you, fonts you could work with, sounds, audio for effects or for background music if you want to play that in your game, the sprites, your image, you know, sprite sheets, images, things like that, all your resources would go in there. Right? And to set it up is as simply as just setting a property on your application. And you would set that in your initialization code in the app delegate. So a little bit of work to get started, right? You have this bootstrapping code to get the application going, you set up an application delegate to handle some callback stuff and a little bit of initialization code in there, okay? And then what do I have to do though? I wanna get something on the screen, right? So af after I've done all this, just a little bit of work there, I wanna get a scene on the screen. And that's what this class called the director does. The director manages loading scenes, right? Think like a movie kind of metaphor, where you have a director and it's the director starts a scene and you move to another scene. That's what the director's doing, right? It's a, the, the API for it is a little different. Um, you'll see than other Cocos 2D app implementations, if you are familiar with them, where they typically have it in a singleton. We have it available, it's a little more object oriented here, so it's available um, off of the window class. And you see the simple line of code here. To replace the scene, that would load up um, a scene. Just go to, through the window default director and I can replace a scene. And then the scene is the thing that's managing sort of a screen. Um, so when I did that code, I would just load up this first screen. But what's in there? This scene and this layer and these other things. Let's talk about what you're actually doing to get this thing on a screen. Here's the transition. So as I mentioned, a scene is sort of, you can think of it like a screen, right? A game, a level within a game, if you're talking in game speak. But it manages, the, this is where you're managing the game logic for that particular portion of the game, the level, so to speak, right? You can factor the thing out where you'd have um, character, you know, for characters, your sprites could have logic built within them so they'd be reusable across the game. Or for a simpler game like the one I'm going to show you, you can do it very much top-down right within the scene. And a scene contains layers. And the layers contain is where you start building up all the nodes that have your game. So again, to recap, we have an application. Application starts the game, right? Sets up the app delegate to manage application callbacks, such as moving into the background and a little bit of an, coming back to the foreground in a little bit of application initialization code, such as setting the content, uses the director to load a scene. The scene is a, a level that contains the information about what you're gonna see on the screen. What are you seeing on the screen then, you may ask? It's these layers, right? So what's a, CC, a layers modeled in a CC layer class? And that's where you be begin to build up your node hierarchy. 
If anyone came to my, my, um, my talk on, on scene kit, it's, conceptually there's, there's a lot of similarities here. Except here you're, in cro you're 2D and you're cross-platform, but you're still building up a node tree, right? And you're, you're letting the rendering happen for you underneath. So that conceptually is this, this conceptual similarity there, right? So I have this CC layer. The CC layer is added to a scene. It contains the node tree. Nodes are everything you have in, 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 the, node, in the scene graph, right? Sprites, labels, menu systems, things such as that. Okay? And you can schedule um, timers, basically, within the scene to do things every time through the game loop or at specific, delta, you know, at specific delta times if you don't want it to happen every time through the game loop. And you can put game logic in, in the timers, such as to check collisions, game logic to when you should end your game, things such as that. Okay? Very easy to do scheduling. Um, now, when you're creating a layer, you have to get this scene that adds a layer to it. The pattern that most, that, that's typically followed in Coco Sharp is the layer, which you'd have some subclass of layer, and you'll see that when we do it, go through our example, would have a factory method that gives back a scene, the scene which contains the layer that has the factory method in. So I'd have a layer subclass, and I'd have a, a you know, factory method, a static method that says, give me back a scene off of this layer, and in that factory method, I actually create that scene and add the layer to it. Pretty straightforward. It's a pattern that, that, that you, you often see in, in across Coco Studio, and we follow it in Coco Sharp, or at least I have in the samples I've made. Okay, so now I've got the scene, I've got the layer on the, I've got the layer added to the scene, but I still don't have anything really in the game. I haven't added anything into the screen. I just have a blank screen at this point. I want to put things on the screen, such as in the first screen of this little game here. I have a label to tell you how to start it. Real simple game, or maybe more interesting things. So. There's the code to add the layer with the factory method, as I mentioned. I do that with, but the things I put on the screen, the characters that you're using, really, the images, are, are sprites. What a sprite is, is a class that abstracts a texture. And of course, everything's being happening onto the GPU. And, and you can't have a, a compressed image to go on the, on, onto the GPU. So it manages the uncompressed you know, image, the texture, that gets rendered off of the GPU, and then can be moved independently. So that's what a sprite is. It's an image that's that abstracts the texture abstracts the interaction with the GPU, and you can then move, move independently of other images through touch, through animation, through physics, things like such as that. Okay? The image to, to get the content for a sprite can either be a loose image in the content file, or it can be contained in something called a sprite sheet, which I'm going to talk about in a second. There's a convention as well. It goes in the content folder, all your resources do. And there's a convention um, type way to load up high definition versus low definition graphics, and that's handled automatically for you. There's some differences when you move between platforms with the resources, but the convention part works fine. Okay? Now, you can load loose images, right? But more efficient than that, it, to, a more efficient way to do that is a thing called a sprite batch. This is really one of the biggest, if not the biggest, performance one you can get when working with this. Um, in this example here, I have these little circles to represent balls in a sprite sheet. A sprite sheet is just a single image that contains a whole bunch of other images, and you have some metadata about where all the images are, like it, they, they also called texture atlases, and some people term them that. And you just want to then basically pull out all the images you have from it. The, the point of it is, though, it gets rendered in one pass. So you'd have underneath the covers would be one GL buying call, rather than having a bunch of calls to render this image, this circle, this circle, this circle. It's just you're repeating the same one over. So it's just a more efficient way to load up stripes. Um, you'd, ha you'd, have, you'd have less interaction between the GPU and software. So that's what I'm doing here in the example where I have the circles. So it's just efficient sprite loading, renders all the children in one pass. Underneath the cover is one GL pine pass. If you don't understand what that is, don't worry. Just know if you have a bunch of images that are same, uh, similar, you don't want to repeat them all in a bunch of loose image calls and a bunch of loose CC sprites. Do it all in a sprite batch. Okay, like I did with the circles in the example I have. Um, so great, we can use sprites directly through CC Sprite. We could use them through sprite batches for more efficient loading of the sprites. Either way would work. Um, but then, how do I do things, right? If I just put a bunch of images on the screen, that's not that's not a game. Um, if I didn't have a, you know, this is this is really the place that Coco Sharp starts to shine in in a lot of the nice abstraction type things that it brings. They have these things called actions. Available, available through the CC action class. Again, if folks want my CNC, my scene could talk, that's platform specific, but similar concepts. So high level gaming type things have these type of things, and this one certainly does in spades. It's called the CC action, and there's a bunch of a bunch of um, specific CC actions, such as move to, if I want to move a sprite to a particular position, rotate to, by, rotate to. So there's either a delta one, by, to go offset 
by some thing, some value, or there's a two one where I can just absolutely move it. Right? And I get animation this way. Additionally, you can chain these actions together. It's almost like writing a script in a scripting language within, within your game, where I'm saying, I have this action, then I'm, after I'm gonna jump, then I'm gonna jump by, then I'm gonna rotate, I'm gonna move back to here. At the end, I can even interject in a function, and I can have an action that just has a, you know, a lambda with my function in it, right, with my own custom logic, and I can chain them all together to run one after another in series through another action called the CC sequence, so it's like a composite pattern kind of thing, or I can use another one called CC spawn to do things in parallel. So very, very easy to chain all these different behaviors together and create interaction in your games. That's what I'm doing here where I'm dropping, I have the arrow pointing to the bananas. I've got them moving down. You know, I could have made it fall with gravity, with physics if I wanted, but I just did it you know, linearly, so it's not you know, perfect motion. I'm trying to demonstrate a lot of different concepts in the game. And then I rotate it repeatedly forever using, and I, chain, I did that all to, by chaining a bunch of actions together. And then to be efficient, I just check in my game logic, and that's what some, one thing I would do in the scheduler. When it comes off the screen, I remove it, because I don't need to keep rendering the sprite into the scene if it's, it's, if it's gone, right? So for efficiency, remove it when it goes off the screen. Okay? So that's actions. Excuse me. So how do I interact with the game, though? Right? Especially on a phone. You have touch interfaces. Now, you could use platform-specific APIs on each platform, and they all have touch APIs. This is, this is where this thing's great. Remember, this is all cross-platform, except for that little bootstrapping code that we have to get the thing started with the application. We have an implement, a, a touch implementation here that you could use to cross-platform touch API. Again, it's gonna look a lot, it's gonna look quite familiar to people that have come from an iOS background, but even a, a minimal set of it, it's very simple to work with. You just have a few methods you override to handle touch. And you, you have to opt in, you turn it on. There's touch is begin, touch is moved, and touch is enabled. You turn it on by setting touch enabled on the, lab, on the layer, okay? Likewise, there's motion on these devices. Things like games like Doodle Jump, right, where you, can, you wanna use an accelerometer to control it. Well, again, just much like touch, we expose a, a class called CC Accelerometer, cross-platform you know, motion support you know, through the sensors. So you don't have to dive into the differences in the two implementations. So this is kind of neat, right? You're getting some things that maybe even could be useful outside of games in a way, even though we're making a fun game talk. There's some other possible uses, uses here, certainly with the touch and accelerometer, but there would be, need to be some more things to go beyond games and, and actually have those. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So again, very easy to work with the accelerometer, very easy code, you just enable it, just opt in, um, just like, just like the uh, touch interfaces, and you just handle a, a callback, it's just trivial, right, and you have X, Y, Z direction to handle the acceleration in, in, in whatever direction. And really borderline trivial, right, very simple to handle touch and acceleration, you know, motion support to control your game. Then you'd have game logic to move the sprites based on the, the amounts of the touch or the, you know, the delta of the acceleration. Okay, so at that point, those concepts there would, would be enough for you to create a simple game. But there's even more, there's, there's quite a bit more. There's a great audio engine that's built into it and it's really easy to work with. You just get at it through simple audio engine shared engine. And this is where you can create sound effects such as you know, a, a sound effect when you tap on the screen and fire or there's some collision effect like I'll show you and you just play, create a little sound. Additionally, there's background sound so you can play audio through the entire game. Some people find that a little bit annoying in games, some people like it. I'm gonna play one at the end, hopefully I won't annoy you too much, but you know, just to show you it's very easy to work with. The background sound is something, a, a, an example of something you would work with in that app delegate life cycle. So where you wouldn't want audio to keep playing, of course you go into the background, but you want it to resume when the game comes back into the foreground, right? Very, very simple to program against. And that's what I, that's what I call, call, call out on the bottom there. Now, is we saw a couple things that were, were interesting and, and cool because it's all cool because it's cross-platform. But you know, I, I mentioned there's touch and there's accelerometer, and clearly those things can be used in a lot of scenarios. But one thing the guys did, and this is great, and this is I'm real excited about this. We have excellent support for primitives. So it, it's not you know it's not all core graphics or something if you're familiar. It's not all a system dot drawer, but it's got quite a bit. Um, it's all available again. Same idea, through, you put it right into the scene graph through the node hierarchy, through CC node, and CC draw node here. And I just show a couple here on the screen. This is really compelling because, okay, you can draw things into a game, but boy, I got a cross-platform graphics API now, and I got cross-platform touch interface. Heck, I can make a cross-platform visualization engine for data 
if I wanted to build something like that. I'm not going to show you that today. It would be not leading in that much. But maybe we'll do that at some point. But it's very interesting. Certainly also interesting in games, because you can do some cool things with primitives and blend things together. I'll show you how I blend it together with one particle system next. So there's the code to create a polygon, really easy, right? And all the code to create, the, to do the drawing code is really easy. It's very high level and abstracted and very powerful. You can do almost a lot of the things people do with the more complex drawing APIs. It's, got, it's pretty full featured, so that's, that's, that's fantastic. But as I mentioned, I just said the word particle system. You said, oh, they have particle systems? You sure do. There's a whole bunch of particle systems built in. And this is great, because <clears throat> If anyone knows OpenGL, you know, a lot of the times the way you may implement these sort of things is with shaders. It, it's not that hard, but, but, but it could require a little more understanding. You get a lot of this, you get this right out of the box. There's a whole bunch of particle systems to create these cool effects. You know, things like you see there with the galaxy particle system. There's a smoke one, there's rain. There's a sun particle system where you can create a sun that flickers like you're in the hazy, you're, you're in the hazy desert. I have that one to show you. There's a, you know, one that looks like little fireworks and it's a, an explosion. Looks almost like a, a, a bunch of confetti going off. Also have that one to show you. So again, they just get added into the scene, right? And say, hey, I want more particles. I want a particle system. And then you, you can do it based on an, a collision or on touch or whatever you want. Really, really easy to program against. Very high level API can create very interesting things. Now here, you, know, you're not, you wouldn't be using this in a visualization. This is purely targeting at games. Although perhaps maybe if uh, you made a bar chart type thing and you know, the, the bar chart goes negative and you lost money, you can make something explode or something. So in any event, there's the code to put one of our particle systems up, the sun one, which I'll show you in our example. Again, it, and there's some properties on each one that differ a little bit to control things like emission rates and you know, where the colors would morph to the beginning and end of the particle. Different things, they change a little based on different particle systems. Again, all cross-platform. Right? There's an example of the sun one. And you can see, I actually have, it, it looks like a frying egg is what I ended up with. I didn't really mean to do that, but I wanted to show, so I've got the sun as a particle system. I also have a primitive to draw the circle, and I blended them together to get sort of the effect I want with the color and the white part flickering around. Um, so I got the kind of effect I wanted. It just turned out to look like a fried egg. <laughs> but so if, you, if you're gonna do a breakfast app, you're in, or a breakfast game, you're grab my code. Um, so, that's terrific, right? We, we're, we're getting some, some really interesting things here out of this now. I can do particle systems. I, I've got a really nice way to put in animations. You know, I've, I've got a, a easy to add content. I've got all this cross-platform code that I could use on all these different platforms and just a little bit of bootstrapping code on each to get started with that you have to write that's a little bit different but not all that hard. But there's more. What if I wanted to do parallax? You, you, people play Angry Birds, right? You know, parallax is just, it's, in a 2D game, it's useful because it gives, it, it gives the feeling of depth. It's basically when you have, you know, images basically overlaid and they move at sort of different rate, right? So it, it conveys the feeling of depth. You typically see it in a background with motion where the for, in a game, the foreground sprites, the characters in the game, like the monkey, is moving at one speed and I might move the background at a different rate. So you convey that feeling of depth. A lot of 2D games use it and it's a great way to get some, some some really uh, an immersive experience, even though the game's 2D, to make it almost feel like 3D in, in a way. Not quite, but it does convey a feeling of depth. It's cool. You don't just have to apply them to backgrounds, although it may have been the better use case. What I did it with here, and I'll show you a little video, you can apply it to any node, right? And I have here, you see the, you see the clouds moving up and down? So I've actually, you can, I, what I'm doing there is I'm moving the monkey up and down, and I'm taking the Y position, and I'm moving the clouds at different rates. So I get parallax on the clouds. I think a better use case might have been to move the grass or something. But I just wanted to show that it doesn't have to be necessarily on a background. You could use it wherever you want. And what we've made available is that you don't just have parallax. You could implement it yourself. There's this CC parallax node. Again, a node that's added to the node hierarchy. You just put this node in, 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 in your scene, right? And you add other sprites into the parallax node, and you say the rate basically the, how they would, should move relative to each other. So in these clouds here that I had, I had one moving more and one was moving less, you saw. It's because the ratio between them is set different. I'm not doing any movement code on the clouds. I'm just moving the monkey and saying it should move relative to the value, the y delta of the monkey. It, it's trivial. Now this isn't what you would do if you wanted to have an infinite scroller. It would be fine for an angry birds where you're just back and forth. An infinite scroller, you'd have, that's the kind of thing you'd roll yourself where you'd have an image that you would create in the background and then you'd reposition the image onto the front and you just keep scrolling it one way or another. Almost like the, th the way you deal with table view cells and UI table views or list type things. But for something that is going back and forth, like a background of an Angry Birds style of game or clouds that are just a couple on the screen, becomes very trivial, trivial to implement. And again, you're just adding more. C it's another CC node. 
that you're adding into your, um, into your scene. So the whole thing becomes, boy, once I, can, I create this scene and I start adding nodes to it, and then I add all other kinds of things, I just keep adding nodes and telling, telling, what I, telling Coco Sharp what I want in the scene, and it just renders. And if I want to start having behavior and animations and things, I can do that with actions, and again, it just happens for you, and it's very declarative, very high level, and cross-platform, pretty, pretty awesome. And there's the code, as you can see. I create a parallax node and I add the two clouds to it, okay? And I set a couple ratios. There's actually three in the example. I just showed two for the purpose of fitting it on the slide. So, again, now we're even beyond it, right? You, can, you, could, you could do a pretty cool game with just what I've shown you. Um, but there's more. So actions, as you saw, you might think that's pretty powerful. You can chain all kinds of things together. And I mentioned that you could do custom code. So you can have your own function running along with all the other actions that move and jump and whatnot. Well, Along with that, we have these effects. And some of these are pretty advanced effects. Um, like the one I have on the screen, waves, it just kind of waves an image around the screen. There's a twirling one that almost looks like you're going into another dimension, and there's a lens 3D that blows it up like a fisheye type thing, a whole bunch of them. And what's really cool, it's cool in and of itself that you have this out of the box. Again, it's really high level. You're just dealing with actions in this case. They're implemented as actions. So they can be used right in sort of the action chain, so to speak. And you can just have these effects just uh, be put right into your scene. Very, very declarative, very high level, easy to do. You know, that was really, it's really savvy that it's implemented with actions. Here's an example of the code of one of them. One that you would do a flip. You probably, you've all seen this where you flip from the front of a view to the back like you're flipping a card. And you, know, you can see right here I have a CC finite time action and I've got this CC uh, flip X 3D. So it's going to do the, you know, underneath there's a matrix transformation what it's going to do and it'd flip it. And I put it in a CC sequence because it's just another action. Remember CC sequence is the thing where you do one action after another. So it's just, it can participate in actions with every other action in a first class manner. Pretty, pretty sweet. So you can add some awesome effects. You can go over the top really. But there's more. So there, there's, there's, this is great. Um, I keep mentioning Angry Birds. Like 2D games and some of the cooler 2D games, they implement physics in some way. F physics, you don't have to implement physics, but 2D physics games are always fun, right? Rigid body physics. There's some implementations of things that do like soft body physics where it kind of it, when, the, when the thing would collide and it would, it would, it, it, you'd get the com compression of the, the sprite. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what, what would happen in Angry Birds, that kind of thing. 2D rigid body physics. Um, there's an API called Box2D. It's actually what Angry Birds uses. It's used very, very popular. As a matter of fact, it's, one, it's underneath uh, the physics APIs that Apple is shipping right now in, in their 2D game framework. But that's, we have a C-sharp port of it that's available. Right? So you can use the C-sharp port of Box2D. You could use any 2D um, C-sharp physics API and bring it in yourself. There's another one called Chipmunk. That's, that's, that's available. I think it's actually being built into it as well. But either way, you could use what you want. And Box2, this port of it is actually, it's, it's pretty easy to work with. Again, it's a, it's a nice API, it's very high level. With Box2D anyway, what you're doing is you're creating some, it was originally, this, in this case, it was, it's a, it was a C++ API, so it's a, it's a very linear port to C Sharp in this particular case. But there's, again, there's Chipmunk and other physics APIs. But this one's very easy to work with, it's what I, what I used here. You create some definition class to describe the body that you're gonna add to a physics world. Then you create that body in the physics world, a physics body, from the definition class. You create geometries and fixtures from those geometries, to the geometry that's going to be in the physics world now, right? And then you create um, those fixtures from the body. So physics world, definitions of the physics bodies, some geometries, definitions of fixtures, bodies that are created from those fixtures added to the physics world. And what does all that mean? I want to get a, some shape that's in the physics world that's going to move with physics. A circle, in the simplest case, that will then fall with gravity. But it could be a complex, you know, any path or any ge geometric shape, right? You'll see more code to it when you get into it, but that's the basics of it. Create some definition class to describe the, to describe the physics body, and then create the actual physics body class, and subsequently the same for the fixtures that are created from the physics bodies. Very straightforward, actually. And there's some initialization code to set up the physics world and, of course, time stepping, which you can do in the, um, the timers, the schedule stuff, like I, like I mentioned earlier, where you can check game logic. So pretty straightforward, right? So with that, there's a lot of concepts, a lot of different topics that um, I showed you today. And I, you see this little monkey guy. He gets around, right? Um, and we got the banana. Um, let's take a look at a little game that I cooked together. Um, that's available to you, and we can uh, check out this thing in action here. So, 
I'm going to run it first. I'm going to run it in the simulator. Of course, it works on all devices. Just, this is cross-platform, but I'm just going to show you on iOS for, for time's sake. When it launches, I have this first screen, right? Very simple launch screen. I just put a label on it. All cross-platform code. No, I'm not using UIKit or anything like that. And I have, I have touch handling on here. When I tap it, try not to get too loud on here, I move into the game. Some background music. And you can move around with touch. I'm just going to, you know, it's a simulator. You see the balls are bouncing. So the balls that are bouncing are bouncing with physics. The bananas that are falling are using actions. There's those parallax clouds moving up and down. There's my sun up in the corner. That's a particle system. Look when I collide. That's a particle system. The explosion, what you see, looks like confetti, right? And every time I get, I, I collide with a banana, I make the banana go away and I cause the particle system. I have a timer that ends it. So after my game logic says, in this case, I made it. So after 30 seconds, we'll stop the thing here. After 30 seconds, the game ends. And then I can tap on the, the game where I got the score that would transition to the final screen and I can, I can play again. Now, the balls are actually bouncing with physics. So I, that's why you see a, a, you know, the behavior of the bananas was just to show off actions and the rotation. When they go off the screen on the bottom, I remove them. The balls are actually bouncing with box 2D. Those are physics bodies. And that's why they have the collision as you just saw, how they collide, right? Now, the purpose of the balls actually in the real game is that every, you, you'd have to get the bananas and avoid the balls with the monkey. Um, but it's impossible. My daughter got to it nine. She, she's the world record holder right now. So to even be able to demonstrate it to you, I had to turn off the game ending logic for the ball collision because I can't even show the thing. It's crazy. It's insanity. <laughs> so it's like it's worse than Flappy Bird. <laughs> so um, you, can't, you can't win. Um, but in any event, though, that's the, to show the different concepts. Which the game shows particle systems. The game shows sprites. It shows sprite batch loading. It shows parallax. It shows moving in. Um, animations, which I, I touched on briefly. I'll do it again so you can see. When I move the monkey, see how he's running up and down? So there's a, there's a sprite sheet in there that has all the different frames of the animation for the monkey running. And then you can create an animation from all the different frames in the sprite sheet. So pretty good, right? Pretty, a lot, simple game, but it's got a lot of different things in it. And we've got a background scene transition with the director. And of course, where we go to the... Um, Final part here of the game where we get to the score, I'll wait through the 30 seconds to time on, and I pass a score over and we can man maintain some game state. Okay, let's go over to the code now and take a look through, look through the project and I'll show you what I have here. We just ran it on iOS. I also have the Android project in here. If I go to the Visual Studio version that I have, I have a Windows phone version as, ve as well. Okay, so let's first look in the iOS project here. And I'm big enough here, let me share a little bigger. In the iOS project, there's this app delegate class, right? Nothing Coco Sharp about that. So I started this project um, from just an empty, an empty project. That's how I created it, right? When I started adding things. So in the app delegate is where that code where I added, remember there's a little bit of platform specific bootstrapping code. I created the CC application. I created the application delegate, which I implemented in this guy, you'll see in a second. And I did the start game, exactly what I had in the slide. Just a note, not gonna run it for time's sake, but in the Android version, I've got a little bit of code that's similar, but again, platform-specific code. I've got one, the one line of it that's different because I have to do set content view in Android. If we were to go, and I can show folks after offline if we want to grab me in the hall or I can get my PC down, the Windows Phone version has to load things through the, Z the XAML file. It's like initial, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the classic what you do to start up a Windows Phone application. And then it's the same idea, so there's a little bit of, a little bit of stuff. It's a little bit of different startup code. Call it bootstrapping code, right? So I, just that, I did that all in my example by hand. I just want to mention, the team um, that does Coco Sharp, they've been working on some templates, um, project templates. So even though it's very easy to get started, it's easy when you've, you already know how to do it, right? Like anything. Um, we want to make it easy. So there's, there's going to be some project templates available. If they're not available already, they're going to be available soon. And they're doing project templates for Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio so you can new Coco Sharp game and it'll, you know, so you can get yourself going without having to go through the initial details of this. Of course, this code's all, all available to you. I will also mention there's a walkthrough this whole Gone Bananas, I called it, um, game, um, it's, there's a walkthrough available in the repo that, that, that takes you step by step through it as a tutorial so you can build the whole thing up. So you can, it's good to know, even if you, you end up using project templates um, once you under, already understand things, it's good to know how to build it up from scratch on all the platforms, so it's good understanding. Okay, so that's it though. That's the only code that's different in this example on iOS and Android.
Now, you could start bringing in platform-specific things. If there were an API in iOS that you want to use directly, you could do that. Of course, it wouldn't be shared code, just like, just like any application you're doing with Xamarin. Say something with Xamarin Forms, right? Getting out of the world of games. Just conceptually, I can always dip into platform-specific code. You could do the same thing here. Right? But you know, if you want to stay completely cross-platform, this, this is the maximum you'd have to do, so, which is you know, three and four lines of code. Um, and it's a couple more on Windows Phone. And I've got, in this case, all the code for the entire game in this. I did it in a shared project. Um, the code could also be put into a, into a PC. Oh, excuse me, a pickle. Um, and also, just to mention, everything is available in NuJ. I'm, I'm catching on. I'm catching on. It takes me a while. So, so it's available in NuJ. There's a, there's a variety of different packages available with differences where you, some you can bring in platform-specific things. Some just have the common API. Um, which is what I'm using here. So that's all described quite well in the documentation on the repo. But again, it's all open source. So Coco Sharp and all the samples are all open source. They're in two different repos that I'm going to point you to at the end of the, at the, end of the talk here today. Right? But then once I'm done with my platform-specific code, what do I do? Remember I said I set up the app delegate. So here's my implementation. I'll just get this. We don't need this guy on the side. So you can see it a little better. And I'm just, over, I'm just suppressing from CC application delegate. You know, I do a little, I do that business I said to, there's a little bit of initialization code, such as setting up where the content's gonna go. I have the business about, because I'm doing audio, that music you heard in the background, I go through the CC Simple Audio engine to start that audio, right? I handle also going in the background, if I, if I were on the phone and I paused it, it would stop playing, I'd come back, it would resume the audio. So that's the kind of stuff I handle in there. Again, now we're in the world of cross-platform. The rest of everything you'll see here is completely in a shared, I did it in a shared project, right? Do it in PCL too. I find share project e a little easier to work with if I'm not actually going to make a library that I'm going to ship to people, right? So, and I put the, in this particular case, I didn't build from source. I pulled. I'm just using the package that you can get from NuGet, right? And again, there's a new one coming out with project templates. If it's not out already, that that'll be out soon. So they're doing pretty awesome there. So then, after I start up the app delegate, you'll see I'll go go back in here. I use the um, I, the other thing that I'd mentioned is I want to start. I want to load that first screen, right? That first scene. And what I'm doing. Is I'm, I'm doing it through the thing called the game start layer, okay? So I'm, the game start layer is the first scene that, is, it's, it's the layer that's within the first scene that I'm gonna load. And that's the one you saw with just, that's basically your hello world of games where I have the one screen and I have a label and I had tap handling. I just thought it would be more interesting than just giving out hello world to maybe build a little game beyond it, right? And a tutorial. So that's what we did. And go to the second screen. Now I'm in, well here's the first screen, excuse me. This is the game start layer. It's just a CC layer color. Which is, a, which is a subclass of CC layer that lets me set the background color, right? Very simple. Here's the factory method I mentioned in that pattern down the bottom. So I have a layer. The layer has this method here that gives back the scene that contains this layer. So, so give back the scene. The scene's already got the layer loaded up in it, right? Then I've got, I've got a little bit of code to handle touch handling and to put in that label. The label's another note, right? It's the only thing in this particular scene where I can put in my font, true type font and a bunch of properties. You can get to customize it, the look of it. Fairly simple. So that's your whole world part. But then when this guy wants to transition, after, when he touches it, you'll see in the method here on the top where I have the touch listener on touch is ended. I'm going to that director. I'm saying replace scene, right? And I'm saying replace the scene. But now this scene, going from the game start layer to the game layer. And the game layer, again, has I put in a factory method that gives back a scene that contains the game layer. So let's look at the game layer. And it's, a, it's, it's made to go with a tutorial, so all the logic is top down within this scene, so, and you can kind of go in order of it through the tutorial. In a more complex game, like I mentioned even earlier, you, you could factor things out where I'd have a class for the monkey, and, and I, I can put some logic in there and build it up and make certain things reusable across it. But you know, even th there's nothing wrong with this, though. It makes, makes it a little simpler to follow. Certainly good for a tutorial. But I have all my game logic built into here for this particular game. So what do I have? I have a bunch of sprites, right? The grass, I call, that's your background. I have a particle system for the sun, the parallax nodes to manage the clouds, sprites for the clouds themselves, and then different actions, the rotating of the banana, the falling of the banana, and physics, okay? So that's what I set up. I just basically you know, set up the, you know, the class variables for all of those things at the top. And then after that, I have a little bit of logic down here to do the scheduling. And in this case, this is where I'm doing, um, I'm scheduling every time through the loop. I could do it on a delta T and only run this code at certain, at certain time slices, right? What I'm doing here is I'm checking, I, I, on the collision of the monkey to the bananas, I just did a very simple bounding box collision check, 
simple, works okay. For the physics part where the balls collide, the physics is handling the collision, right? And if it was a more complex shape than, the, than a circle, right? That's why I did a circle, because it's, it's easy. I didn't have to get into showing you something like a physics editor, where you could actually create a geometry to go around the physics shape, right? And there's physics editors that are well known that work, work well with this, right? So that's what I'm doing in here. I'm doing some game logic to end the game, check collisions, and to step my physics world, okay? Whether I should then step the physics world, remove the thing from the, the, thing from the physics world, or do the thing that animates it according to the physics simulation. Pretty simple. Down below, I have a bunch of little, you know, keeping it very top down so you can follow it in a tutorial type fashion. I have a bunch of little helper methods to add the different things, like what I just talked about. The grass, where I'm adding it just straight as a sprite, loose, I just left it as a loose file. If, it was, if I was gonna do it, I might put everything together in, a, in one big text rack, but I'm just doing, trying to show different things. I have the sun, again, it's a particle system, so I'm just creating a CC particle sun. But again, all I'm doing, I'm creating this class. I don't do any of the work to make that sun do that. I'm just using a CC, using a particle system, adding it to my hierarchy. It's simple. And I just keep doing more of this kind of thing. Add the monkey. So the monkey's the, the, the little character that's moving around. And we saw how he was animated when I ran it, right? I have a sprite sheet for the monkey. It has all the little monkey animations in it. So, you know, like the way you do animations, every frame of the animation. So what I do, and this is actually nice in C Sharp, I can use link to find all the textures in the sprite sheet, right? And I can, that, to give me back all the animation frames, and I can create a thing called the CC animation from all those animation frames, and then create an action from that called CC animate, and that's how I can get the monkey, just kind of the walking thing. And then I walk him as he moves, and I move him with a move action, move, move to or move by, okay? So that's how, I, that's how I do all that work, and then I just add the monkey to the scene, add child. Yeah, so I'm just adding it up. Same with the bananas. In the bananas case, I have a little random function that randomizes it across the top in the x direction, and I just let the thing move down, and I cause it to rotate. So it's not a realistic behavior. You know, if you're gonna do it, I'd probably have just made the bananas with physics too, right? Something like that. But to show you the different things that you do. And you'd wanna, as it goes off the screen, I have no longer a need to see it, I remove it from the scene then. So I do that, and actually the last method of the, I just do it in another action where I put, I put code that uh, removed it from the scene, removed it from the parent node. Okay, there's my random function. There's clouds. The clouds, I could have could have done the clouds as, you know, with a sprite batch, it would be more efficient, as I mentioned with the balls. I did it just to show different things. But I'm adding the clouds to this parallax node, and the parallax node handles that motion. And I'm doing it relative to the y, the y delta of the monkey. So the monkey moves in a Y, all the clouds move relative to that, and the relative motion between each cloud is taken care of by the parallax node for me. I just wash my hands of it and I just use CC parallax node. C couldn't be any simpler, right? Um, there's move clouds and there's the thing that actually moves the whole parallax node. I don't have to get into each cloud's movement and figure that out. Pretty sweet. There's the collision logic where I said I have bounding box thing, nothing too complex there. I have, there's the, and here's the part where I, I check if, if the monkey hit a ball or if the monkey hit a banana. If the monkey hit a banana, I play that other particle system, I remove the banana and I play that other little particle system and am I playing it, I mean I just add it, right? And if the monkey hits a ball, I end the game, which there's my turn off part that I said because I can't, I can't last two more than a second in the game. <laughs> so if I turn that on, the game would end immediately. So I put the timer, so I have two different ways to end the game, you know, just for demonstration. So if the ball could count, right? Meaning if I hit a ball, game's over. Um, ending the game's end game logic, I stop the timers, I have to unschedule everything so the timers don't keep running in the background. And as I'm on the final screen, things would, you know, I'd still have these timers running behind somewhere and I don't want that because then, the, then, then eventually the performance would degrade because I would just, it, it's like the game would, it, it's, it would, it was like it would keep doing things, not like, it, it's as it would keep doing things on, while I'm on the final screen, don't want that. Right, so there's a little bit of game engine logic there. And then the touch handling, okay? And the touch handling is where I actually do the calls to the monkey animations, the actions. And it's all in a nice walkthrough available, and you can go through this top down and describe step by step. You can see this is kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. If it got into a bigger game now with a lot of levels that have, again, more of the same kind of things, you'd want to factor it a little different, like any other you know, larger project, because the one class, it would get unruly. But the code would be the same, design or not, the code would be the same. It'd be this simple kind of code, 
right? I didn't, one thing I didn't get into, I didn't even show effects in here. So I could have, that's one thing I'm gonna add. And I didn't show accelerometer. So you know, just for, for time's sake of, you, know, you get too much in one tutorial. But we could do a nice addition to this would be moving the monkey based on the accelerometer, perhaps adding some kind of a different, one of the, one of the different effects. Because again, there are also just actions that can be added, just like rotate, just like move to, move by, jump by, jump to. You know, pretty, pretty easy. There's the sun particle system down there and I just set it up and add it like anything else in any other node in the, um, in, in the scene graph. Now, I mentioned that I have a primitive. Um, not really the classic use of a primitive. I think you could do some cool visualization type applications that aren't games with this. We may do something like that at some point. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a circle node and, and so it'll blend with the particle system of the sun and I get the fried egg effect sort of thing, right? Down the bottom, the last thing. So at that point, you'd have everything except the balls, right? Remember on the scheduler up the top, I had the time step, the one scheduler, the time step, the physics world, right? And either subsequently remove the ball if it's off the screen or animate the ball and there's a single call you can do, it, it'll, it'll animate it for you based on the physics simulation. What I'm doing there, down here, is I'm actually initializing and show this in, the slide. There's, a, there's a little bit more to it. There's a few other lines of code, but this is just the initialization code of the physics world, where I create the physics world, create the fixtures, create the, the, the bodies of the, the circles as they're adding to the thing, and set up gravity, right? You can change gravity directions, things like that. You can do more, you could add forces, impulse forces, a variety of different things. There's joints you could add, a variety of different things you can do with physics. And then I add the balls, and adding the balls because they're physics bodies, there's a little bit of code in there to create the body definitions uh, for those things. It's very easy to do, because I don't have to get into a physics editor in this case, I can just go with a, a primitive circle shape. Right? Last thing is this on enter to initialize the physics and that factory method, like you saw in the game start layer. The game over layer is just like the game start layer. I do two things different. I add a big picture of the monkey, as you saw on top, just to do something, right? Make it look like more than a label. And I have the score in another label. So I just have that state just to show you how to pass state across to it. And if you tap it, you just, it transitions back just with replace scene again. Only this, just like I did on the start screen transition to the game scene, right? In the game layer the final screen transitions to the game scene in the game layer. And again, and that's it, and that's how you, that's how you can, um, and oh, um, one other mention, you can handle all touches at once, or you can do targeted touch one at a time. So you have, you have granular touch handling. And that's it, and again, the only code you're writing that's different, if you want it to be, to be this way, is just the bootstrapping code. And we now have, or will have soon, I'm not even sure I gotta talk to the guys, um, um, project templates to get it started earlier. So let me go back to the slides here now. We'll wrap up. These are all the concepts I've talked about in the game. So we have resources. The source code for Coco Sharp, all available on github.com slash mono, Coco Sharp, it's in the mono org, it's all open source, right? Works on our platforms that we support through our products, works on Windows platforms, okay? Windows Store, Windows you know, Phone, and so on. Um, additionally, this is all these samples, such as the tutorial I showed today, and a bunch of other samples, such as this really good one, Angry Birds clone, called um, Angry Ninjas. You can have completely open source. We're happy to make that all available to you. Take that code out and use it. And one other thing I'm gonna mention in here, there's a bunch of tests in the, that come along with the Coco Sharp project, right, to test all the different kind of features, like particle systems, touch, sprites, audio, parallax, you name it. Bunch of little tests, there's a plethora of them. They're great other than being great for tests, to test things, they test all the little features, they end up being great little samples to learn how to do everything. That's how I learned how to do a lot of it. So those, that's another resource, you'll see it in the, in, the, in the main source repo that you can take advantage of. And yeah, there's a forum on the Xamarin forums if people have questions about it, you know, check out those, go in there, and the guys hang out there. I also wanna, Kenneth, Kenneth um, Pouncey over here, is the main lead developer of uh, Coco Shop. I just want to call him on. He's done like yeoman's work, done a great job building this thing up over the last year. <laughs> so yeah, Kenneth is great. So, and that's it. Thank you. If you have, we're kind of, I kind of ran to the end of the time. I'm going to be out and about. If folks have questions, we'll do it this way. If you want to see some things or talk about some different stuff, we can go out, we can get out of the room for the next speaker and we can like, you know, chat in the halls and about whatever you want. And thanks for coming, guys.